I'm Bernie Weisgerber, U.S. Forest Service Region 1 Historic Preservation Team. And we're here to do another one in our series of historic preservation trainings. This one is at Garnet Ghost Town in Montana, a BLM property. We're going to do log structure stabilization and, uh, and repair. And if you'll come with me, we're going to start by inspecting some of these log buildings. Let's start our inspection with the simplest of log buildings, which is a horizontal log construction with round logs and a saddle notch. Most of these buildings here at Garnet Ghost Town were miners' buildings, and they were put up to be temporary structures. So the simplest of construction techniques were used because they didn't intend to be here very long. Now you can see that there's some deterioration on the ends of the logs here, uh, but basically this building is not in bad shape. The daubing, which is the mortar between the logs, has started to deteriorate. Um, an inspection on a log building is actually quite simple. Uh, a simple tool like a pocket knife for a probe or an awl. And these logs are fairly sound. Usually where we find problems is the sill logs, and it looks to me like this sill log has already been replaced once in its life. And it's not a bad uh, replacement. It's, uh, it's sympathetic to the uh, construction of the building. But now let's take a look at a little bit more involved log construction. This log building is a little bit more involved. It's hewn log, and it was hewn with the broad axe. We're going to cover that phase of a log restoration and log construction a little bit later. But you notice that it's surfaced off here. It's tooled here. Now, the, there were reasons for this, and uh, uh, primarily it was done so that it could be sided. Um, historically, only poor folks lived in log buildings, and the goal was to get it sided. And if you look just around the corner here, you'll see that some of the siding is still over the logs on, the, on this building here right now. So that was one reason for hewing it off. Another reason to hew it was because logs rot from the sapwood, which is on the out exterior of the log. So if you hew off the sapwood, you're exposing the heartwood to the elements. Makes it more durable. On the interior, the logs were also hewn in order to allow for wallpapering, flat walls, and a more livable space. So this building here was built as a more permanent residence. And I understand from the ranger here at Garnet that this was a cabinet maker, a builder, owned this building here in town. Now there's been some preservation work or some restoration work done to this building, and I feel that I need to point out that these bottom three logs here are replacements and not a particularly good match to the historic logs. You notice that the hewing does not match the sizes, they're uneven, 
as far as the wall goes. And what we really want to try and do in, in historic preservation is to match the existing as, uh, to the best of our ability. We're still looking at this fine hand-hewn log building here. We're on another corner. And this corner shows, uh, it exposed, that it had a broad axe hewn corner post. That's a bit unusual with uh, horizontal hewn log buildings. They usually have a half dovetail, full dovetail, steeple notch, tenon notch, instead of a corner post. But I need to point out that there's been some repairs done here that are not very sympathetic. This piece here was chunked in here. It's pressure treated wood, which doesn't match. It's sawn as opposed to broad ax hewn. It's a butt joint here, which I would not do. I would do a half lap joint. It's not a very good tight fit. Sizing isn't right. It's not a very sympathetic repair, and we want to stay away from that in historic preservation. The first step in the hewing process, after you have the log on the yokes and V'd in at about knee height, which is comfortable to work at, is to position the log the right direction for the hewing to take place on the two opposite sides. And uh, you want to do that to hew the sweep out of the log. If the log has a sweep, you rotate it with the PV or the cant hook to get it in position. Once it's in position for the sweep, it's time to do your layout work. But first, you want to dog the log in to the yokes using a log dog, which is like a big iron staple with the edges contrary to each other, to go with the grain to hold it in place. You dog it on both ends and on the opposite side of the log from where you're going to start the hewing process. Then you lay it out. Now one side of this log has already been hewn and laid out. But I always start off at the top end of the log instead of at the butt end of the log because uh, there's more room for, for a wig more wiggle room when you get to the other end if you have more wood left there. So the tools are quite simple. For a plum, you need a, a small square. You need a chalk line. And I'm hunting around here for my, my hammer. And you need a carpenter's pencil to lay this out. So what you do is, and most of the hewn log buildings are between six and eight inches in width. So with one side hewn off, we'll come out here eight inches, because this is a large log, and we'll put a mark right here. Then, and I'm working sort of backwards here, uh, or upside down here from normal. Then what I do is lay it out with a plum mark on it. Get the bubble nice and plum. And because it's dogged and you're not going to move it, your orientation won't change. Lay it out like so. Next will be snapping the chalk line. And what I usually do at this point, and especially since I'm working by myself here, is I usually cut a little V-notch right in the top to hold the string. Then I take a small nail, just put it in down here anywhere. It's fine, just enough to hold the chalk line. Take your chalk line, hook it on there, and drop it in the notch. Then walk your chalk line back on the log.
Do your layout on the other end here for your width. Pull your chalk line to your mark. And then you have to snap your chalk line. Now your chalk line should be snapped straight up in the same plane as your healing. It helps at this point if you have somebody else. Line it up, snap your chalk line. The actual hewing process starts with scoring of the log. And there's a couple of different techniques for scoring, but I recommend that you use a single blade pole axe. For me, a little bit shorter handle, about 32 inches is what I like, but you have to fit it to your own, to your own size. Um, I'm also partial to the older uh, true temper axes. The process for scoring, and there's two types. There's a V-notch with juggling, and then there's a slash scoring. Uh, let's start off with the most difficult, which is to chop a V-notch. And on a larger diameter like this, a V-notch is the best way to remove the bulk of the wood before you go to the broad axe. So what we do here is carefully cut a notch into the depth of the line and then come over here and you keep, you keep cutting these V-notches into the depth of the line before you go too far down and that's not very clean there probably probably camera jitters there you go like this and you split the bulk of it and again carefully all this work is best done from on top of the log um, you can score from the ground, but it means that you have to rotate the log more than one time. So this is called, this process is called juggling. The most common method of scoring is slash scoring, and those are the marks that you usually find on the log and usually done with a smaller diameter. The idea is to set up a rhythm as you work your way down the log, scoring again to the chalk line. Um, and if you can get them evenly spaced and placed uh, each shot one right over the other, it makes for a better, more traditional look. So we'll see rather I can do that for you or not. That's the scoring, slash scoring process. And uh, it's uh, we're trying to get, keep the marks three to four inches apart and one over top of the other. There's a little, if you would, there's a little dance that, that goes with this, a shuffling motion that you do to keep the rhythm going on it, to keep your even spacing. After the scoring process, we move to the broad axe, the tool that really does all of the hewing work. And the majority of hewn log buildings, at least in the west and in the east, uh, except out of New England uh, area where beams were hewn with the adds, it was all done with the broad axe. And I've got uh, three different broad axes here for you to look at. This particular model is a Pennsylvania pattern, and it's my grandfather's. It has an S-bend handle on it of ancient origin. 
large blade and quite heavy. And of course, the weight is an advantage. The second one, and the one I'll probably use for you in this demonstration is a New Orleans pattern. Head shaped a little bit different, a lot more delicate, refined, does a very fine job. And uh, my particular favorite on a head pattern. This last one is another Pennsylvania pattern, but it's a reproduction that comes from Woodcraft Supply. And it has an S-Bend handle on it. I don't like where the bend is, and it was steamed and bent. But uh, of all of the newer manufactured broad axes, this one seems to, uh, to be the best. Uh, still not uh, real sure with it yet. I haven't used it a whole lot. I still prefer the historic ones. So the hewing process is one of removing the rest of the wood to the line. That sometimes on a larger diameter log like this, that sometimes takes two tries at each side. And that would be score and score with the, with the pole axe, hew with the broad axe, come back and score the last time to the line, and again use the broad axe to finish. Traditional broad axe work worked forward with it. The terminology bark your knuckles came from this historic process where as you're chopping like this, your knuckles are in jeopardy on the log. That's why historically you hew forward, creates more room for your hands. The handle is offset. This is a dog leg offset to give you a little bit more hand room in there. Now, I also like to hew backwards, even though it puts my fingers in more jeopardy, barking my knuckles, because I can see the plane that I've just worked on, and it gives me a better sight line if I go that way. But we'll start here and do it in a traditional fashion. The broad axe is raised and lowered in an easy motion. It's not swung real hard. Got a knot right there. I should mention that historically, and even today, it's necessary to work on a green stick. This process doesn't work very well at all on a dry log. It just splits it out. So you can see I'm working forward with the process here. The finished product, after it's dressed off, you're taking thin shavings and some of them are quite thin for an axe and it leaves a fairly smooth smooth surface with just a hint of the scoring marks left in it when you're using the broad axe, if you miss, especially on these thin shavings, sometimes the axe will go on by, let it go on by. Don't let it go into the dirt and the rocks. The wood chip buildup will keep the, save the edge. But don't try and pull a missed shot like that. These axes are heavy enough as they are. If you do it all day long, uh, your forearms will be burning. Actually, your forearms will be burning at the end of the day anyway with this because it's mostly forearm work. So don't pull it. And if you get, if you get a chip stuck on the ax edge when you go and stop and remove it, otherwise you'll get a glancing blow. And you should keep this leg tight. And I'm hewing right-handed right now. Keep this leg tight and this leg out of harm's way. I 
I'm just roughing it out right now. I would come back and rescore and rehew, like I told you. Today, in historic preservation, we have to sometimes marry the old with the new. And we do some chainsaw work where necessary. We'll finish it off in the same traditional scoring, hewing process, so it looks the same. But this speeds up the process quite a bit for us. And what I'm going to do here is slab this off. And I'll just get this started for you so you can get the idea of it. But the chalk line is here. You run a line down your chalk line with your chainsaw once to score the line. And then you cut, uh, cut to the line. You can uh, see that when you slab with the chainsaw like this, it gives you a somewhat flat surface to start off with. And you should cut to within 3 quarters or an inch of your chalk line and then score and hew it, hew it with the broad axe for the final finish. Even though the foot adds, is not uh, a hewing tool per se. Um, it still is a tool that's used in log work and heavy timber construction. And this particular one here is a carpenter's adze. It has a half a pole on it, uh, which distinguishes it as a carpenter's adze. The, the traditional way to use this tool is to stand on top of the log and chop right towards your feet. So I'm going to do that while I'm looking at my feet. The adze is actually a plane. It's a dressing tool that takes down the surface. Uh, when broad axe hewn logs uh, were dressed up for parlor beams, they were planed off. And you'll notice that it leaves a smoother finish, although undulating, but also a fairly thin shaving. And in a lot of cases, not much, not much thicker than a plain shaving blade. It's time to notch the log, and the notching process is, uh, is one we're going to take you through right now. But first, we have to hew off the interior surface. On this particular historic cabin, there was a rough hewn surface on the interior, and that's what they're doing now is just knocking the edge off. It's time to do the layout work on the log that's going to go in the building next, and it's over top, sitting over top the log that it's going to be resting on. This is Kerry King, preservation carpenter on the Forest Service crew, and he's using scribes here to set the depth of the notch. That little spray bottle is just water. The log surface is rough, and we use an indelible pencil. It leaves a better mark if you wet it down. It's difficult to get a good mark anyway. And here you can see the surface. It barely leaves a mark on it. So we try and give it every advantage to get a good mark. He's holding the scribes with the plumb vials level in both planes so that the notch corresponds accurately to the log below it. It's already set to the right depth. And you can see the vials here where he's holding them level. 
This particular log had a little V-notch with the log above it. So he's got to chunk off uh, some pieces here. This will have to match the notch or the V-notch on the log above it. It's going to lay it out with a, with a square. Nope, other side of the square. Get it just right and mark it out. To set the depth on this particular cut, since the log is set plumb and level, you can work right off the level. It gives you an accurate measurement on round diameters. We're going to use the chainsaw here again to speed the process up. He's notching it to the line. We'll finish it off with, with traditional tools. Whenever we work on on historic buildings with modern tools, we always finish them off with axes, adzes, slicks, chisels, gouges, whatever the appropriate historic tool is to give us the, the finish. I've got it smoothed off. We're ready to turn the log here to notch the mark for the saddle notch. The pencil line doesn't really show real well, so what Kerry's doing here is using just a, a carpenter's chisel to score. In the notching process, you a lot of times lose the pencil line, so he scores it first with the chisel so he won't lose the line. Going to use the axe completely on this one and not use the chainsaw. He's going to rough it out with the axe. And he's just about got it roughed out to the line here with the axe. And then it's going to be finished off with a gouge. This is a large gouge that we use just to get the final fit to the log below and the notch is a little concave so that it rests down good on the log below. Time to put it in the building. We get everybody on the site, use the timber tongs or swede hooks to safely carry it to the building. We're going to see if it fits here. Press it up into place. We crib it to hold it. Check the final fit. Looks good. Get the final wedges in and crib it, and it's time to start on the next log. A lot of our work in log preservation, log building preservation, requires Dutchman repair. And Dutchman is a piece that's fit where we've got a deteriorated or rotted section of log, either a crown end out at the corner or even mid wall. And this is Dale Swee, one of the Historic Preservation Team's carpenters, and he's mixing some epoxy here. We use epoxy in log preservation as an adhesive. We don't use it as a filler, and we don't use it as a structural component. We use strictly wood repair, and the only epoxy, as I said, is, is an adhesive surface. And what, what Dale's doing here is he's already fit and this is going to be a half, what's called a half lap Dutchman or splice. And he's coating the surfaces that have been carefully fit to each other with the adhesive. And you can see the half lap. There's a corresponding half lap on the Dutchman. I might add that at this point, uh, Dale wasn't really concerned about matching diameters, only about getting the two surfaces flats to each other. The diameters can be dressed off after the logs are fit together so that you won't notice any diameter difference. 
it's actually an advantage to have the diameter of the of the Dutchman be a little bit larger so you can dress it down. They're fitting the half lap together and going to use these band clamps to hold it tight. You can still see where the corner notch would be there. They're fitting the piece, driving it tight. The band clamps are snug but not completely tight. They've tightened the clamps and raking off the excess epoxy right now. And you probably can't see, but the diameter is a little bit larger. After the epoxy sets up, it's time to dowel it together. He's drilling this out for two dowels in the half lap. They're three-quarter inch dowels, which is adequate. And he's drilling them contrary to each other, at an angle to each other, which helps hold it together. Fitting the dowels, and we use an oak dowel, sawing off the excess. He's not cut it flush at this point because he's going to dress the whole surface down. And it's ready. Another important part of log repair, and we've mocked this up here again, just like the uh, Dutchman repair, is called a face splice. When you've got a wall log that has a deteriorated portion, you cut it out, it's cut on an angle here, cut square here, and you're putting it right, and this is the, the piece that Dale has manufactured, and it fits right in like so. And again, it's clamped in place, and it has, it's epoxied in between, just like on the Dutchman, and then it's doweled and dressed off to match the diameter of, of the log. So this is another method. If, if the log is not deteriorated on the face more than 50% of the depth, you can do a face splice without removing the, the log from the wall. We're here at our project site now, and BLM prepared the site for the training, excavated, put in a retaining wall, and jacked and cribbed the building for us. Now, there's a number of techniques on replacement, one of which is to remove all of the deteriorated material and crib it like this. Another would be to start at the base and remove the deteriorated logs at the base and rebuild from the base up and crib between the new section and the old section. That prevents the building from being so high in the air and so much cribbing. But this is a proper technique for cribbing here with this crosshatch method close to the corner to catch it. And as we go through the building, you'll notice that there's a series of these, which are miners, called miners wedges. And we use them to tighten up. And they're used against each other, one against the other like this, one from the inside and one from the outside coming together. And we've also, to catch this weight here, we've also put uh, what's called a post shore in here. As we move on, you'll see that there's a whaler on the wall here, which ties the logs together. Um, some log restoration work is done by Jack and under the whalers. I don't advise that. I like it. And this is what we use for our jacks. We use these bell-based screw jacks. And you'll get a, another look at one on the back side, a, a better look, to carry the weight. As we keep moving, another whaler, some more cribbing with more wedges. And now let's talk about the, uh, the foundation on this and what, what this, should, this building should have a stone pier system, a rock pier system supporting it. 
we've our BLM has poured a footing below grade here and will come up with stone to carry the weight of the building on the corners and mid span. I want to talk about the daubing on log cabin construction. And the daubing is this actual mortar uh, substance that's between the logs. It's, uh, today it's referred to as chinking, and that's inaccurate. The, uh, the chinking is the log billets that are split and placed between the logs, and then the mortar is put over top of it, the, the cement mix, daubing mix. So this is daubing. Now, the daubing historically was, was uh, made up of, of two or three major components, one being water, one being lime, and the other being an aggregate, which was most likely creek, local creek sand. It made the daubing soft. When you can crush it in your fingers like this, it's uh, primarily lime and sand and water and no Portland cement. Uh, this dates the daubing on this building. At later dates, there was a certain amount of Portland cement mixed in. Now, there's no magic formula for daubing, and uh, some daubing mixes have uh, horse hair mixed in with them for a binder. Some have hog hair. Um, even straw is mixed in at times. Sometimes you'll find barbed wire back in there to help hold it in. What you have to do is to try and match this historic daubing in both color, hardness, the size of the aggregate, which gives it the appearance. Uh, it gives, gives it the, its, its look. Now, that's why I say there's no magic formula to it. We, what we do is we take some of this and use it as a sample, and then we mix a sample board up of, of uh, three basic components, and those are over here. We've got sand, and the color of the sand, or the aggregate, determines the color of the, of the mortar. And then we've got, we use a little bit of type one or type two Portland cement in either Gray, if we need to darken the color a little bit because the sand or the aggregate's not dark enough, or in white. And this would be more historic. And the main component in, the, in this type of daubing is lime. Now, this is a type S hydrated lime. This is a type 1 uh, white Portland. This is a type 1 or 2 gray Portland. There are seven types of Portland stick with type one or two, which are the most common. The mixture that we use, the recipe that we use, we, we, we pick a starting point, and then we work softer and harder from that starting point. In a little bit, we'll mix up some for you and put the patches down on the sample board. Then we let it dry, and we pick it up, and we do just what I did here, we put it between our fingers. We see how hard it is. We're trying to match that. We look at it for the aggregate, and we look at it for the color. Then we're ready to actually redaub the building at that point. On this corner of the building here, we've done some log replacement already. But we've cribbed it back away from the corners on either side to carry the weight. We've attached sway braces here to keep the building from shifting around. And you'll notice that there's three replacement logs here. In other words, the original logs were too deteriorated to, uh, to repair with either a Dutchman or a face splice. This one is a replacement, this one, and this one. And you can see some of the layout work on the end of this for the notching system on this particular log, which differs from some of the others in the saddle notch. The, uh, the logs are not a very tight fit. It's pretty sloppy. It was a temporary, meant to be a temporary miner's cabin. What I'd like to show you here, though, is that it's not necessary, in order to replace a mid-wall log, it's not necessary 
to split the building, to jack the building apart, to remove the log because the notches hold it in place, or to disassemble a building and reconstruct it. All you really need to do is to split the crown end off on the log above it. And what we did is we sawed this back to the notch, do it on the opposite corner, take the piece, save the piece, slide your deteriorated log out, fabricate your new log, notch it, slide it back in, put your piece back in place, glue it and or dowel it in place. A lot simpler and cheaper method. I might add that most of them don't come off and go back quite as well as this one did. We're looking at this back wall again where we've got a couple of replacement logs in here. And you may notice that there's some deterioration on the log above this. And BLM's management plan for Garnet Ghost Town is that it be managed as a ghost town. And so they didn't want to do a face splice on this one here. These were completely gone, had to be replacements. But I want you to see some of the cribbing that we have here. And again, I don't always like for the building to be this high. I would prefer that we had started with the, the been able to start with the base, build in between, keep the gap small, and crib in between. But this is a good cribbing system once it's this high in the air, cross-hatched. Again, the bell base screw jack, which is the only thing that I recommend you use in this line of work, I do not recommend uh, and I do not allow hydraulic jacks. They go up too fast and they come down too fast. So if we go on past here, you'll notice that there's another bell base screw jack or house jack. And there's also some more cribbing on this end, which is carrying the whole load, sway braces on either end. Let me say a quick word about safety. It's imperative when working on a building like this with the crew that you pay close attention to all members of the team, removing cribbing, removing wedges, slacking the jacks off, backing the jacks off. Uh, be sure to communicate with everybody so that Nobody on the front side of the building is letting a jack down when you're working on the back side. The jacking and the cribbing should be set up in a safe manner like this. A lot of use of the miner's wedges to tighten everything up. Thanks for joining us in another one of our historic preservation trainings. And we're about to leave Garnet Ghost Town, move on to another project. We hope that you can join us in the future for another one of our sessions.